What is the appendix? What is the function of the appendix? Does it do anything? Or is it just a vestigial organ that we don't need? I'm gonna make this clear to you today at Citizen Surgeon. Let's do it. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon, and I'm here to get you comfortable on the wards, in the ICU, in the operating room, and of course, to crush your exams. But today we're gonna to be talking all things appendix. Now, I have this video on appendicitis, but today I wanna to get to the heart of what the appendix is. I'm always asked by parents, well, do we need the appendix? Does it, does it have any function? Is there a cost to removing it? Well, today, if you watch this video to the end, it's gonna be clear that the appendix does have a function, it does have a benefit, and if we're gonna remove it, we better have a good reason to do that. So first, what is the appendix? Okay, well the appendix is a worm. We also call it the vermiform appendix, or worm-like. Now it's not actually a worm, but it's a small outpouching of intestine that is in the large intestine just after the small intestine joins the large intestine right in the cecal area, okay? And it is about nine centimeters long and a normal diameter of the appendix would be six millimeters, okay? Now, I was reading in Wikipedia, I put the reference in there that there's been appendixes that have been as long as 35 centimeters. That's, that's huge, okay? But the average length is nine centimeters, all right? Now, why is the diameter important? Now, the diameter is important because if the diameter is enlarged, okay, so seven, eight, nine millimeters, that's how we diagnose appendicitis. So that's one criteria to diagnose appendicitis. Okay, so that diameter is important for anybody that has a uh, function to take out appendixes like I do. So you can see here we have the ileum joining the cecum at the ileocecal valve, okay? And then we can see the blood supply to the appendix is off of the terminal branch of the superior mesenteric artery. That becomes the ileocolic artery, and the ileocolic artery gives off the appendiceal artery, which has these branches to the appendix. Now, the appendiceal artery and the appendix kind of run parallel to each other, and off of that appendiceal artery, you get these branches into the appendix. So oftentimes, when I'm taking out an appendix, I'll take advantage of that space between the artery and the appendix with my hook electric cautery to take down that blood vessel and make that totally hemostatic or without bleeding so I can safely get the artery away from the appendix and then divide the appendix from the cecum. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit because we're not talking about appendectomies today, we're just talking appendix today, okay? So let's get a little deeper into the appendix. If we had a cross section of the appendix, what would that look like? So here from Kui et al, I have a nice histological cross section of the appendix that shows all the different layers. Number one is the meso appendix. So that's the vascular supply to the appendix. And you can see that's sitting outside of the outermost layer of the appendiceal wall. Number two is the muscularis externa of the appendix. Three is the submucosa of the appendix. Four are the lymphoid follicles that you can see here, and I'm gonna talk about that in detail a little bit later. Five is the mucosa, or the innermost lining of the appendix where the epithelial cells are in the enterocytes. And then six is the lumen of the appendix. So why is six important? Well, when in appendicitis, the lumen of the appendix gets obstructed either with lymphatic tissue or with a fecal lith or kind of a poop stone, okay? That leads to the pathophysiology of appendicitis and I talk about that in the appendicitis video. So here's the big question. Why do we have an appendix? Well, we have an appendix for two major reasons. Now, the first is to aid in digestion, okay? How does it do that? I'm gonna tell you. And number two is the immunological function or the immunological benefits of the appendix, and that has to do with gut-associated lymphoid tissue, or GALT for short. 
Now, for a long time, the appendix was thought to be a vestigial organ, okay? But not until really we started to dive into it, researchers broadly, in the 2000s, to get an idea of what possibly could the appendix do, all right? If we look at cross species, we find that the cecum, the appendix, or cecal patch are really important in cellulose digesting species, okay? So, rabbits have a huge seco appendix, have a huge tubular structure that is really helpful in establishing the microbiome, the beneficial commensal bacteria in the gut, as well as processing cellulose that's been digested from leaves, every other thing that they're eating. But there are other species that don't have an appendix. So when we look at tamarins or other non-human primates, several of those don't have an appendix. And also reptiles, snakes, they don't have an appendix and they don't process any cellulose, okay? So, so across species, we see quite a bit of variation when it comes to having appendix or not, all right? So in humans, why could it be important to have an appendix. Well, we love to eat plants, okay? Vegetables are part of any healthy diet, but we don't have cellulase, we don't have a enzyme to break down cellulose. It just passes right through us, okay? So that's not why we have an appendix, all right? So why do we? Well, to understand that, maybe we should get into that microscopic structure of the appendix just a little bit more, okay? So what is the structure of the appendix? So I'm gonna bring back this histological cross-section again, and we're gonna start from the inside out, okay? So just past the lumen, we have the mucosa, and the mucosa of the appendix has columnar epithelium, and we see that throughout the gastrointestinal tract, with the exception of the esophagus that has stratified squamous epithelium, okay? But from the distal esophagus all the way down to the anus, we have columnar epithelium, all right? Well, in the appendix, we have columnar epithelium, and that has our enterocytes, it has goblet cells, it has a lamina propria, and a muscularis mucosa. Now, interestingly, when we look at the structure and what cells are inside the mucosa of the appendix, we get a ton of immunoglobulin A and immunoglobulin G plasma cells, okay, or B cell producing cells. The other cell that we see a lot is the macrophage, which is a dendritic cell, it's an antigen presenting cell, okay? So this is different than other parts of the large intestine in that there's a super high concentration of IgA, IgG producing plasma cells as well as macrophages. In addition, within the enterocytes of the appendix, we have intraepithelial lymphocytes or IELs. And these IELs have a very high concentration of CD8 positive T regulatory lymphocytes, okay? So there is some immune regulation associated with the enterocytes of the appendix that is much different than that found in the rest of the small or large intestine. In the submucosa of the appendix, we see densely packed B lymphocytes, okay? So B lymphocytes are those immune cells that produce immunoglobulin, and we have relatively few T lymphocytes. Now, inside the submucosa, we have these lymphoid follicles, and those lymphoid follicles have a particular architecture, and within them, there are a range of different immune cells. Now, when you think of these lymphoid follicles, I want you to think of Peyer's patches in the small intestine, okay? There's some similarity here. Now, the architecture is that you have dome epithelium, you have a mixed cell zone, and that mantle zone is composed of small B lymphocytes. You then have a germinal center, and that's full of central blasts, centrocytes, follicular dendritic cells, antigen presenting cells. And then you have a T cell area, which has T lymphocytes, okay? That's usually CD4 positive, CD8 positive 
uh, T lymphocytes, okay, and then macrophages are in that area as well. So you can see that in these lymphoid follicles that are within the submucosa of the appendix, there is a lot of immune activity and immune regulation that's going on. Now, because there are a lot of different immunological cells in this area, it's thought that if we don't get proper differentiation of the cells, so for example, if our T regulatory cell population isn't high enough, we can get a pro-inflammatory state. And there has been some discussion of a role or relationship between the appendix and ulcerative colitis. Okay, and we're gonna talk about that briefly towards the end of the video. Now, if you're liking this video, give it a like, give it a share, subscribe to the channel. This lets me know that I'm on track and you're finding these videos valuable, all right? And let's talk about something a little bit different, and that's gonna be the appendix and biofilms. So first, what is a biofilm? Now, we talked about this in the wound bed preparation video, so if you need a refresher on that, definitely check out that video. But biofilms are basically a slime of bacteria and then this self-producing polysaccharide matrix, okay? And so the bacteria are protected within this biofilm. Now, I talked about it with wounds in a negative context. So for example, in wounds, if you get a biofilm, for instance, Pseudomonas is infecting the wound and you're not gonna be able to really get that wound to heal until you can get rid of that biofilm that's protecting Pseudomonas. Well, in the gut, the biofilm is this insoluble layer between the lumen and the enterocyte. And so that assists the enterocyte in protecting itself from invasive bacteria. So for example, Clostridium difficile. Now healthy biofilm has this sort of feedback loop. So we get bacterial adherence in the gut, then we get biofilm formation from mucin that's secreted from the enterocytes, okay? We get biofilm expansion, so the biofilm's growing, getting bigger, and then we get biofilm shedding, and so that creates this cycle of healthy biofilm with commensal bacteria in the intestinal lumen. All right, now what does biofilms have to do with the appendix? Well, because the appendix has such a narrow lumen and it's relatively protected from feces, the appendix is thought to be one of the sources for healthy biofilms and healthy commensal bacteria in the gut. Now, if we look at diarrheal illness, perhaps cholera or a viral-associated diarrheal illness, the appendix is relatively spared from the diarrheal illness, which will wipe out the biofilm in the intestine and wipe out the healthy commensal bacteria and expose those enterocytes to possible injury. So the appendix is sort of a safe house for healthy biofilm and healthy commensal bacteria. Now, when we talked about the mucosa of the appendix before, we talked about a high concentration of secretory immunoglobulin A and IgG producing plasma cells, and it's the secretory IgA with mucin that helps produce healthy biofilms. So what I want you to take away from this is, number one, so the appendix isn't just useless, it definitely has a feature in helping with digestion by producing healthy commensal bacteria and healthy biofilm formation. So to review the relationship between the appendix and biofilms in the large intestine, we see that the appendix is small, narrow lumen, protected from feces, okay? The biofilm, the commensal bacteria are spared after diarrheal illness. The appendix as a safe house has a high density of secretory IgA or immunoglobulin A as well as mucin producing goblet cells. And finally, there's a high density of commensal bacteria within the appendix and that's the bacteria that we want lining our gut with that healthy biofilm, okay? So these four things are important when we start to think about, well, what is the proper function? Why do we have an appendix? So there is an association between appendix and disease, okay? So first, what comes to mind? Well, appendicitis. I am a pediatric surgeon, so unfortunately, I have to take out quite a few appendixes every year due to either simple or complicated appendicitis, and I talk about that a little bit more in the appendicitis video. 
all right? Second is ulcerative colitis. Now, we talked about all of the immune cells within the appendix, and there is a very complex immune process that's occurring. Now, if this is dysregulated or out of balance, it's thought that early inflammation in the appendix may be related to the development of ulcerative colitis later on. Third is cancer. Now, the two major cancers we see in the appendix, we can see carcinoid tumors or cancer-like tumors, but they are capable of metastases, so we label those as cancers. They can be found in an appendix, and I'll be talking about that in a later video. We also see adenocarcinoma. So, for example, a mucinous adenocarcinoma can be found and can develop within the appendix. One of the reasons we always send the appendix for pathological evaluation is because we need to rule out the presence of a cancer causing that clinical presentation of appendicitis. And finally, like we talked about with diarrheal illness, the appendix can serve as a safe house for bacteria and help repopulate those healthy commensal bacteria with the biofilm after an illness and uh, help prevent or protect those enterocytes which are at risk of injury. So I hope you enjoyed that talk today on appendicitis. We learned a lot about it. We answered those questions. What is the appendix? Why do we have it? And what's it good for? Okay, so what is it? We learned it's a pouch-like structure coming off of the cecum, has its own blood supply. And in cross-section, we have that mucosa, we have the submucosa, we also have the muscularis, then of course the mesoappendix. We talked a lot about all of the immune cells within the appendix and how that makes it very unique in comparison to the rest of the colon. And with respect to function, we learned that it helps us with digestion, okay? It helps us digest because it helps populate those good commensal bacteria. And with the immune function, we learned about the uniqueness of the appendix, whether it's secretory IgA or mucin production from goblet cells, and how that helps the rest of our gut health, okay? If you like this, give it a like, give it a share, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment. I love engaging with you guys. As always, study hard, be safe. I'll see you next time.